This is CBC Here and Now. When it gets down to the non-consensual sharing, it's, 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 there's just no excuse. It's absolutely inexcusable. It's a terrible thing to do. The fact that um, the burden of proof is on the person who's sharing the images, I think is radically different. Tonight, the province wants to make it easier to protect victims of so-called revenge porn. Proposed legislation to help victims who've had intimate images shared without their permission. And we have this story. Three babies in nine months. It's so unusual, it actually has a name, Irish triplets. Coming up, we'll speak with this young family of six about bucking the baby-making trend. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. It's a quick picture, evocative, revealing, sometimes erotic, and it's meant for somebody who can be trusted. But sometimes circumstances change. That intimate photo can become leverage and then a nightmare. The government is working to intervene in cases like that, where nude photos start circulating without a person's permission. Here now is Katie Breen is following this story for us. She's joining us now live. Katie, give us the details of this proposed legislation. Well, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons says Bill 12 is about three things. Giving power back to victims, making sure that people who share intimate images are held accountable, and deterring that vengeful behavior. Once it's done, it, I mean, you can't take back that pain. New legislation introduced today will give victims the ability to sue and courts the power to have photos taken down. But even Parsons admitted today, once an intimate photo is out there, shared without consent, it's hard to completely erase it. Picture it if you're a student in, in the school system and you don't want to go back, you have to face other people. It is that, that whole thing of you go out the door, you don't know. You know, is it the person in the grocery store that has already seen it? There have already been revenge porn cases in this province that have gone through the criminal system, where the punishment is up to five years in jail. Civil court will soon be another, less invasive option. The victim won't have to prove that having their picture shared hurt them, and the onus is on the person who shared the photo to prove they had permission to do so. The fact that... Um the burden of proof is on the person who's sharing the images, I think is radically different than anything that we're accustomed to seeing. And I think that in and of itself should give people pause for thought. In this case, I think the negative action is upon the person that shares it. So if you want to do this, the burden is on you. There's no cap on how much a victim can sue for. Justice Minister Parson says that will be up to the judge. In the meantime, he has little sympathy for those on the sharing end. I don't care if somebody comes forward and says, well, this is harsher. I'm sorry, you could have avoided this. So, and that's the deterrence message that we want to send out to people. It's just, this is avoidable. Uh, you know, just because, you know, like I say, revenge is not a good enough reason to do this and you will pay. Bill 12 will have to go through royal assent before it's passed into law. Parsons hopes that can happen within the next month. Now, once it is through, it will be forward-seeing, meaning that a civil suit won't be an option for people who've had this type of thing happen to them in the past. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. Going to get weather early tonight for a very good reason. Yeah, some nasty weather heading our way. Ashley, uh, just give us some uh, details or highlights. Yeah, the weather board or the warnings board <laughs> is lit up tonight. We've got a number of uh, colors here, and that's because essentially there are uh, warnings everywhere across the province. We've got a wind warning for the entire island uh, at some point over the next 24 to 36 hours. Winter storm warnings from Labrador all the way down through to the west coast, down through Port of Basque. And then for areas of central Newfoundland and uh, the interior, a snowfall warning in place. And then uh, we've also got a storm surge warning from White Bay all the way through to Cape Race. So the system will move in tonight. Uh, we're going to start to see that snow for the southwest spreading across the island as we head through to tomorrow morning. That's going to briefly change over to rain into the afternoon, and then the winds shift out of the west. Some cooler temperatures move in, and then we're going to see some snow squalls develop along the west coast. And then even parts of Buren and the Avalon into the afternoon on Wednesday and into Thursday as well with this system. 
Now, before that snow changes over terrain overnight tonight, we could pick up about 10 to 15 centimeters for parts of the interior and uh, the west or rather central, and that's why we've got that snowfall warning. So here's a look at the timeline for St. John's and Metro. The winds are going to be light tonight, but we are going to pick up a quick two to four centimeters of snow into tomorrow morning. Temperatures are going to rise above zero. We're going to see that change over to showers or drizzle. 10 to 15 millimeters of rain is possible. Reaching a high near 10 degrees by the time tomorrow afternoon rolls around. That's when those winds are going to pick up, gusting upwards of 100 kilometers per hour out of the southeast. They'll switch to the southwest, gusting upwards of 100 kilometers per hour. Then late day Wednesday into Thursday morning, that's when the strongest winds are going to be. We're going to see gusts close to 120 kilometers per hour for parts of the Avalon. I'll have all those details and how much snow is on the way for other parts of the island coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Police in Labrador West are looking for an armed robber. Now, it's hard to make out just what he said there, but the masked man said put the money in the bag and no one gets hurt. The owners of Lakeside Convenience Store posted this security camera footage to Facebook. Police are still looking for the man who pointed a gun at a loan clerk and then demanded cash. Anyone with information is asked to contact the RNC or Crime Stoppers. Meanwhile, police in St. John's are investigating separate incidences after two taxi drivers were confronted by a robber with a gun this morning. On Cornwall Crescent, a taxi arrived for a call. Police say this man got in, tried to rob the driver, and then struck him before running away. The driver was taken to hospital with minor injuries. About a half an hour later in nearby Amherst Heights, the same thing happened to another taxi driver. In this case, the, the robber stole the taxi, fled and crashed it. He got away on foot with another man. Police are still looking for the man. Newfoundland Labrador has the third lowest minimum wage in Canada, and now advocates are calling on the province to raise the minimum to $15 an hour. It's now just above $11. This morning, Common Front NL launched its campaign for a higher wage. It's asking people to sign a petition on its website. The group says people who work 40 hours a week earning the current wage will only make $23,000 this year. Spokesperson Elise Stewart says they've heard from people all over the province about the tough financial choices they must make. We uh, held town halls across this province. So we were in Labrador, we were in Gander, we've been on the West Coast, we've been everywhere. And from those town halls and those round tables, what the the stories that came out of that were these stories where people saying, okay, you folks have a lot of research, but I don't know how I'm going to pay for my child's you know, winter coat this year. Or as the cost of heat goes up, I don't know how I'm going to heat my home. I have to choose. A court in Jordan has sentenced nine militants to prison terms ranging from three years to life. This after a shooting rampage two years ago that killed a Newfoundlander. 62-year-old Linda Vatcher from Cornerbrook was in the country when shooting broke out at several locations and she was killed. Vatcher was visiting her son who worked in the region. He was injured by a bullet. Nine others were killed in the attack. The Jordanian court said the group was involved in helping Islamist militants in attacks on the area. The court found them guilty of abetting terrorists and committing acts of terrorism. Vatcher was well known in West Newfoundland as a former teacher and volunteer with the food bank. And now turning to provincial politics, the authors of reports about alleged bullying and harassment in the legislature will not appear at the House of Assembly. Mostly Legislative the Standards Commissioner Bruce, Bruce Chalk head of the firm Reuben Tomlinson look into allegations of bullying and harassment against MHA's Dale Kirby and Eddie Joyce. Now that firm exonerated Kirby and Joyce. Chalk used those findings in his final report, which found Kirby and Joyce had violated the MHA's code of conduct. The government suggested the firm might come to the House to answer questions, but Reuben Tomlinson has declined that invitation. House Speaker Perry Trimper says it's time to move on from the scandal and that there's room for MHAs to improve their behavior. These comments about politics being very difficult and so on, it is difficult and it is challenging, but it doesn't need to get into this uh, personal, uh, you know, attack and, and challenge. I think one could go in there confidently. If you're prepared and you understand your material, you should be able to stand on your feet and defend it and not have to answer to some other silly personal attack.
The fight against illegal ATV use in this province has intensified since the summer ended. Police say they are cracking down on underage riders, but the real battle is with their parents. Ryan Cook brings us the latest in Fatal Fun, a CBC Investigates series across Atlanta, Canada. The RCMP hates seeing things like this. Common sense rules being broken on ATVs, especially by kids. But police say they're having a hard time getting the message across to parents. They're not buying into what you're selling. They don't understand the risks that are there. Um, they seem to think it was fine when they grew up and, you know, it should be fine for their children as well. So it's, it's tough to get that understanding of the level of risk. Here at CBC, we've been getting more and more of these press releases from Corporal Garland and the RCMP. There's one here about a 12-year-old from Anchor Point caught driving down the middle of the highway, a 14-year-old who fled from police and ended up in a bog hole, and a 12-year-old in Buckins who was driving back and forth to school. Since September, there have been seven investigations into underage ATV use. Four of those have resulted in charges against either the parent or the owner of the ATV. Kids, you want to be on Safety advocate Rick Noseworthy is happy to see the parents being punished. We don't have a problem with kids on ATVs. We got a problem with parents giving ATVs to kids. It's as simple as that. Like, there's no kid can afford to go out and buy an ATV. Somebody is giving them those ATVs and they need to be held responsible. Nobody under the age of 16 is allowed to drive a full size ATV. At 14 and 15, you're allowed to drive a much smaller bike, a max of 90 cc's. But police say there's the law, and then there's rural culture. Some of our smaller communities, again, you get that, um, you know, that culture and that mentality that this is okay or permittable, um, a, a normal thing, a day-to-day -day thing. We've seen children that have been using that as a mode of transportation to and from school. It's not acceptable, it's not legal, and it's not safe. It might be a common cultural thing, but that makes it no less illegal. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Now to read more about that story and others from our Fatal Fun series about ATV use in the Atlantic provinces, head to our website, cbc.ca slash nl, and stay tuned for more stories in the coming days. Well, Gander's search and rescue teams have been moved to St. John's because of the discovery of asbestos in their hangar. Authorities say the move is temporary. Here now is Garrett Barry now with the details. Asbestos was discovered in settled dust inside Hangar 1 here at the 103 Search and Rescue Squadron. The Armed Forces says there's none in the air, so some employees are still working in this building today. But two Cormorant helicopters had to be moved to St. John's. A spokesperson for the unit says there will be no impact on search and rescue operations while the helicopter crews are away. The forces say they are used to this type of thing and routinely train and work with cormorants in remote locations. The choppers have been in St. John since November 2nd. The move happened after a contractor refused to work in the hangar where the asbestos was found. Daily maintenance is taking place. The forces said additional inspections will take place in Halifax to make sure the choppers are fit to fly. But there's no set timetable for the cormorants to return to Gander. Before the choppers can come back, the asbestos has to be removed. And before the cleanup happens, more testing needs to be completed on the inside of the hangar. The Armed Forces says the result of those tests won't be available until the end of this week. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. This isn't really about banning specific types of ropes. What it's about is figuring out where to put ropes so that the gear will last longer. Researchers at the Marine Institute are trying to build a better fishing trap. One that doesn't leave plastics in the ocean. Jane Aidy has that story for us right after Ashley's forecast.
I think the great thing about St. John's in growing up here is that the population is such that it keeps you honest and real and accountable, but it also leaves a lot of room for creativity and expression. There's also that sort of appreciation that we have for people's quirks and their characters. People just kind of allow you to be whoever you are here. We just roll with it. Now, staying with Chrissy Holmes, I'll be co-hosting the story behind the story on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Tomorrow night, it starts at 7.30 Island Time. CBCNL will pull back the curtain and share some of our experiences and stories. Our team of journalists take you inside what we do, share some of the tricks that we use, tricks of the trade, and insight into TV, radio, and online journalism. You can watch all of that online on Facebook and YouTube starting at 7.30 tomorrow night. That's 7 for viewers in most of Labrador. Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. Okay, so Ashley, I've got some garage advice to ask you. I look at my garage and I see my snowblower in the corner with various bags of leaves blocking my access to it. Do I get rid of the leaves or do I move the snowblower? What do I do? Well, uh, that completely depends on where you are across the province, especially tonight. So we do have a number of warnings in place. Snowfall warnings for the most part for uh, parts of central and the interior. So that's where we're going to see that snow between 10 to 15 centimeters through the night tonight. Now, the, the temperatures are also going to increase with this system. So the snow will change over to rain at some point in towards the early morning hours. But by morning, seven degrees for Port of Basque, we can see the center of that low just offshore through the evening and overnight hours. That's going to quickly move further east into the day tomorrow. But southeast winds 80 gusting 120 along the coast from Port of Basque up through to Gross Morn through the night tonight. And then uh, quite the change in temperatures, though, the Straits and St. Anthony sitting zero or just below into the overnight hours. Mary's town looking at a temperature near zero and then St. John's similar temperature. The winds are actually going to ease before they strengthen into the afternoon tomorrow. So here's a look at that snowfall forecast. Again, we'll see anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of snow by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, up through St. Anthony could pick up closer to 20 centimeters and then again briefly changing over to rain into the afternoon and that's because of those temperatures climbing. Uh, Grand Falls winds are 5 degrees 12 in Marystown tomorrow. Parts of the Avalon also in the double digits should reach 10 degrees for St. John's before those winds change to a more uh, west southwest or rather northwesterly flow into the afternoon tomorrow as well. Late day is when we'll see those winds pick up for uh, the northern peninsula and then again change back over to snow as more uh, cooler temperatures move in behind that system. So Wednesday night into Thursday afternoon we'll see more snow on the way and we could see accumulations the most along the west coast and that's where those winter storm warnings are in effect. We're going to see uh, another potentially 10 to 15 centimeters in some of these squalls through the afternoon. So if we talk about the winds, because that really is the story over the next 24 to 36 hours, those winds will pick up strong tonight again from the Port of Basque all the way up through to Gross Morn gusting upwards of 120 kilometers per hour into tomorrow afternoon widespread gusts between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour. So if you do have things outside, especially tonight, I would put those away or make sure that they're tied down for the most part. And then that low moves offshore. In behind that is when the strongest winds will develop from Twillingate all the way through down to uh, Cape Race. It looks like that's where that storm surge warning is in effect. So we could see gusts if in up to 120 or 130 kilometers per hour, even 140 to 150 for extremely exposed areas. So that's a look at the forecast for tonight and tomorrow. We'll look a little bit ahead coming up in a little bit.
Waves of Change is a series in collaboration with our CBC colleagues across Atlantic Canada about the use of plastics and the impact on the environment. Tonight, we'll meet some researchers from the Fisheries and Marine Institute who want to build better fish traps, traps that don't harm the environment. Right now, plastic rope from fishing gear is one of the main sources of microplastics in the ocean. Jane Aidy has a story about an ongoing experiment to try to unravel this particular pollution problem. Inside an experiment lab at the Fisheries and Marine Institute, fishing ropes are being put to a tiring test. Plastics researcher Jackie Saturno and her supervisor Brett Favero want to see how quickly they wear down and fray, sending little pieces of plastic out into the water. You could imagine a fish eating these. Yeah. Saturno consulted with fish harvesters to find the four most commonly used ropes. This white one is what? This is nylon. Nylon, and it seems pretty yeah. durable. It's a very strong rope, okay. uh, probably one of the most expensive uh, okay. out of the bunch. Okay, and this blue and red one is what? This is uh, polyethylene. Okay, and then we have the green and red. And this one is polypropylene. Polypropylene. And you, the fourth kind is green with red and brown. This is actually a blend between polyethylene and polypropylene. Okay, but all four are made of plastics. Yes. Do you want me to give you some slack here, Jackie? Yeah, okay. please. Next step, simulate a sort of ocean environment. Saturno started with a huge tank of water, then created a mini seabed where ropes often break down. We uh, basically took a board and glued on a whole bunch of rocks and uh, um, as well as sand. This one doesn't have sand, but we uh, tried to simulate a, a realistic environment that ropes would have in contact with. Okay, so the rope, the idea is that the rope will go back and forth, back and forth over this really rough surface. Yes, and uh, then we get to uh, see how much plastic comes off. With a pulley and winch system connected to a computer, she controls and records a set amount of chafing. So how many times will you test each rope. So we have the four ropes and we're going to be doing 10 trials per rope to try to get the same results and uh, that will give us 40 trials. Saturno collects the bits of plastic that break off into the water. She counts the larger pieces and weighs the tiniest. We're going to publish the results of this study. We're going to, we found these things about these different ropes and it provides a platform for other people to do the same study. And what this is going to mean is other researchers can look at their ropes as well and we can get a really good picture at a larger scale. The research is still in the early stages, but already one rope holds up better. I've noticed that nylon, it's a strong rope, but it doesn't fragment as much. Um, so that uh, is definitely a positive thing for, um, for that particular plastic. The others are not only fraying more, but fraying faster than expected. I think when we first pitched the project, we thought that we would be having these ropes running overnight and it would take a long period just to even get a small amount of fragmentation and it was pretty surprising to see how much plastics were breaking off in just a short amount of time and just seeing all of them scattered on the surface of the water really put in perspective of how much plastics could break off when they're being used just for regular everyday fishing. You can really see these big fibers. Yeah. Whereas these researchers say the results will reveal wins for harvesters and the environment. The gear will be stronger and it won't pollute as much. And that's the bottom line. It, is this isn't really about banning specific types of ropes. What it's about is figuring out where to put ropes so that the gear will last longer. It's not just which gear should we use, but how should that gear be designed. Longer lasting gear for fishers will hopefully haul in healthier fish. Jane Aidy. CBC News, St. John's. In a province where the number of deaths exceeds the number of births, a young couple living on the island's west coast is bucking that trend and giving new meaning to the phrase one big happy family. Yeah, they certainly are, Debbie. They are the proud parents of four children. Get this, including twins who were born just nine days ago. But what's really unusual is how close three of these siblings are in age. Here now is Karen Stokes with their story. Three-and-a-half-year-old Malcolm loves his new baby brother, Grayson, and now he has another brother and sister who are even newer. The girl is named Mia. And what about the boy? Eli. <laughs> it's going to be 
my big happy family. <laughs> Six weeks after Grayson was born, Samantha Palmer and her partner Brad Stubbington found out she was pregnant again. It was a shock. My doctor was like, wow, this is like the closest turnover I've ever seen of somebody having a baby. And he was been a doctor for 37 years. Then came the kicker. She was pregnant with twins. Every five minutes we're like, we just kept saying twins, <laughs> like, is this real life? It meant the difference in age between Grayson and his twin siblings would be unusual. Nine months, three days, exactly. So <laughs> it's very, very close. It's so unusual, it has a name. Siblings born within a year of each other are known as Irish twins. But in this case, less than a year, it's Irish triplets. We went from three to six within a really short span of time. <laughs> How old are you guys? 20. Wow. They met in high school. Dated for about half a year and, <laughs> and then we were expecting Malcolm so we were 16 with him and it's okay she knows what you're thinking right now honestly if if I wasn't in the situation I'd probably be thinking the same thing so I'm not gonna judge anybody for judging us we came from very good households like our both my parents were police officers like it wasn't I we, we felt like a pretty big disappointment at first so I was like we need to make sure that we do this right nobody's in our home nobody sees how how much love there is and how much it, all these children mean to us the couple is from Ontario and now live in Porta Basque, where Brad is studying to work in the oil and gas industry. He also has family in Codroy Valley. They say that even though so much of their life so far has been unplanned, they do have a plan for the future. <laughs> We're doing the very best that we can for them. Like Brad's going to be being able to support us until like, till they're old enough for me to go and get a career. <laughs> what do you want to do? Um, I actually want to be a police officer, <laughs> like my parents. And there are perks to being young parents. By the time they're adults, we're still going to be young, and then we'll have, we'll have the money to do basically whatever we want to do and still, be, still have <laughs> half of our lives ahead of us. But for now, the family is temporarily living in St. John's to be close to the infants who are still in the neonatal unit at the Health Sciences Centre. The doctors want to make sure they're both healthy before letting them go home. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a positive attitude, too. Absolutely. Congratulations yeah. to them, but yeah. it, it obviously was a surprise, but fair, everybody looks fabulous. Yeah, fair bit of work involved in that uh, young family, but it's really great to see people from Ontario helping us repopulate the entire <laughs> province on their own, but uh, good luck with the family. Samantha and Brad are so appreciative of the help they've received at the hospital that they've started a fundraiser, not for themselves, but for other parents with babies who have to spend time in the neonatal care unit. Yeah, and they're partnering with the St. John's business Newfound Baby to create what they're calling CU bags. The bags will include medical supplies that parents might need once they get home with their babies. Uh, that includes things like breathing and heart rate monitors. And Samantha says all of that information you can see at the bottom of the screen is on her Facebook page, which uh, you can check out. So for me, when I came here and started to realize what my body was capable of, I gained a whole new appreciation for it. Well, it may not be the most well-known sport in this province, but a local gym is producing national martial arts champs. Discover Muay Thai.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, nobody at the rooms, neither its board of directors nor its CEO, will discuss the recent hiring of a former Liberal staffer in a senior role. Carla Foote is set to take over as executive marketing director. That job pays $132,000 a year, and she landed the position without any job competition. Now, I've tried several times to get anybody at the rooms to explain how they approved this hiring decision, to ask if Ms. Foote is qualified, why was it so urgent, or whether the minister responsible for culture imposed this on the rooms. And each time I'm told to put my questions to the minister, Christopher Mitchellmore. And I tried to do that this afternoon at the House of Assembly. Mr. Mitchellmore, why did you impose a gag order on the rooms from discussing the hiring of Carla Foote? But the particular matter of the, the rooms itself, I've said that I'm the minister responsible for the rooms, and in this particular matter, when it came to the lateral position that was hired, the two lateral positions actually, I'm very pleased with the, the individuals who were hired, no, Carla Foote and order. Ann Chafe. Dean Brinton and the board of the rooms have essentially been put in the witness protection program because you won't let them answer any questions. Ms. Foote does not have a university degree. She's never worked in a museum. She's never worked in an archives. The only reason we're to believe she's the most qualified is because you say so. Nobody at the rooms will answer a question. I would why, say that why won't they? It's very disappointing that you would take such an approach on How so? an individual who it's basically placing the reputation of an individual who is amply qualified and has 20 years in the industry when it comes to being able to do this work. Never worked in a museum. I, I want to highlight that no when degree. it comes to the rooms, we have a board of directors and a CEO. And I had engaged with the CEO and the board of directors. There has been a review of the structure of the rooms when it comes to how it operates since Bill 56 has been put forward. And there was determined that, based on the flow of activities, that there would be two executive level positions created. And I'm quite pleased to see that Ann Chafe is the executive director of yes. museums and galleries. But the question, and that Carla Foote is the executive the, director of the... The question, of Minister, the, with all due respect, is why have you ordered the rooms not to talk about this? You say she's the most qualified, that it was urgent. We try to ask the board or CEO, Dean Britton, about this. We're told, ask Mitchell Moore. So we really can't double check anything because you've told them to basically keep their mouths shut. It is within the roles and responsibilities of the minister responsible for the rooms in this particular matter when it comes to an executive level hiring and a lateral move. Ms. Foote is amply qualified and she held the highest position in government responsible for the marketing and brand but division of the core of government and she was also involved in communication. She the has way a 20 forward. year history. She helps you she with the way forward so she gets this nice job. It's not the legality, Mr. Mitchell Moore, it's the ethics. Don't you see that this looks like liberals hiring liberals? I feel that the person who is in this job, Carla Foote, is amply qualified to do so. This is a lateral move. These positions happen. They have happened. And I'm very pleased to see that she is in this role, serving in the capacity so that the rooms can do the good work that it does. Muay Thai is not the best known sport in this province, but a gym in St. John's is producing national champions. Recently, fighters from eight Lim Muay Thai took home five gold medals and a silver at a competition in Ontario. Here now is Jeremy Eaton, stopped by the gym to learn a little more. Muay Thai fighters practice punch kick combos in the eight Lim gym in St. John's. It's rough, it's tough, and it's not very common in this province. Muay Thai is the art of eight limbs, so you use your two fists, your two elbow, uh, your two knee, and your legs as well for your kicks. Back out. Here's my left kick, and I'm gonna come back out with that. The gym boasts up to almost 300 members. Eight of them recently traveled to a national competition in Ontario. The Newfoundland and Labrador team walked away with five gold medals and two silver. To me, it doesn't matter about the result except for what we put out as a team at the very beginning. He's going to keep out nice and long for me. Owner and fighter James Richard pushed his athletes hard to get there, and they've also pushed themselves. Jenna Halloran says she joined five years ago to build some self-confidence, showing off what she found at the national competition. It was a really big challenge for me, and my biggest goal was to just kind of overcome the fear. Um, of getting in the ring and there's a lot of different factors that come with that um, and I did that so I'm super proud of myself. Fighter Mark Perry fought his way to one of those gold medals losing more than 100 pounds in the training process. Drive by the gym every day kept saying to myself I'm gonna go there one day I'm gonna keep going there one day and one day I said heck with it and I just dropped in 
and I haven't left since. I spent more time here than I do anywhere else, I think. The advanced athletes train as much as six days a week, like Charmaine Beckett, who won a silver medal at the national competition. I had done other kinds of training. I had done weightlifting. I was always relatively active. But there's still sort of, you know, as women, we all have these body issues. So for me, when I came here and started to realize what my body was capable of, I gained a whole new appreciation for it. International student Heidi Gonay moved to St. John's about a year ago from Egypt. He's fallen in love with the sports, a local girl, and the province. When I won the gold medal, I told my teammates, like, to get the flag, get my Egyptian flag with my Newfoundland flag, so I can raise them both together, as to, to, to show the people like I'm such like I'm very proud of of living in this province. Along with the seven medals, the local group earned enough points in the national competitions to be crowned best team. A big win for this little gym. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. We research the history. We do the storyboards for the trail. After the break, we'll head to Gander, where some history buffs are highlighting the town's past. They left the city and created a homestead. Steve and Lisa McBride, the homesteaders. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Well, some devoted history buffs in Gander are bringing the past back to life by erecting storyboards on walking trails where thousands of military personnel once worked. During the Second World War, Gander was one of the most important aviation hubs in the world the linchpin between Britain and North America. Recently, Here and Now met up with researcher Patty Penny to tour the trails and to remember the critical role that Gander played in the 20th century's biggest conflict. My name is Patty Penny. I'm office coordinator for Gander Heritage Trails. Myself and Natasha Pierce, who is a co-worker of mine, we research the history, we do the storyboards for the trail, and they're situated throughout this system here on the RCAF side and the other sectors. We are an airport town, and of course, without the airport, Gander would not exist today. And during World War II, and mostly from 1941 to 1944, there was nearly 10,000 military aircraft that left Gander to take part in World War II and fight the Battle of Europe. So without the airport, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, probably wouldn't have even won the war, and that's the greatest significance of the airport at Gander. 
Also, it was a, a big hub for transatlantic flight after the war and into the 1950s when 12 major airlines from Europe and the United States and Canada were situated here and it was just a really, really busy place during and after the war. I'm standing on Chestnut Street. Chestnut Street was one of the first streets in the old airport sector, which is where Gander, of course, used to be situated. And it was basically the only street in the whole area that was residential, if you will. Also, if you go down to the north side, which is on the left side, was the first ever schoolhouse here in Gander, called the Chestnut Schoolhouse. And prior to that school being built in early 1940, a few children that were here in the late 30s were actually educated in an old shack on the railway. A teacher would come in from Lewisport twice a week and teach the five or six students that were here in Gander at that time. So it was a big delight, I think, to the children once they had their own little uh, one-room schoolhouse in, in 1941. The purpose of the storyboard is to not only educate people on some of the history of Gander, but is actually to give them a sense of what was basically on that lot, what type of building it was, what it was used for. This here is uh, where the Globe Theatre was once situated uh, after World War II. Uh, the building that was here initially was built uh, as a rec centre for the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force. And then in 1948, they converted the building into what was called the Globe Theatre. It was a 200-seat theatre. And of course, uh, you can imagine now, back when Gander was starting to grow after the war, going to a movie on a Saturday afternoon or one night during the evening. And it was just a place for people to go for entertainment and also meet with friends or whatever. Here at this corner, this was Churchill Street and George Street right here, was, uh, a, a, during the war, it was a canteen for the military, but after the war, it was converted into what was called Duffy's Tavern popular uh, watering hole, if you will, uh, just after World War II. It would eventually convert itself into the Canadian Legion before it moved into the new town site. In the early 1950s, they realized that, you know, this was an ideal place for a town because it was so close to the runways. They eventually did expand the runways. It was very noisy here. There was hangars just across the street. There was three big Canadian hangars that lined here. So it was just a not a good spot uh, to, for a town to grow, so they relocated just west of here about three kilometers, and eventually they either demolished or dismantled everything. I was born here in Gander. For me personally, I, I just take pride. Um, my father, my grandfather, my uncles, they all worked in the airline industry as mechanics, air traffic controllers. And when this came about to do the research and help with the preservation of the town, I was just delighted to jump in and, and, and take part in that. We are promoting our research on uh, Facebook and Twitter, and that's getting out to the public, of course. We're also uh, having people that visit Gander Tours, visit Gander to the Chamber of Commerce and to the North Atlantic Aviation Museum. They get our information and it piques their interest to come out and see what was going on here during World War II. And when they leave here, they'll maybe do a little more research and just start to understand the importance of the Gander Airport to Newfoundland itself or to Canada, but to the world. Pretty impressive history there. It, very impressive. It's yeah. nice that they've uh, drawn attention to it. Yeah. So and you've the rest got of us can uh, enjoy it if we get there. And you were going to say yes, you've got deep ties. <laughs> when I was looking at the black and white uh, footage there of the uh, people going to the theater and yeah. having a drink in the bar and all of that, uh, I could just imagine my parents. They were young when they arrived in Gander, like everybody back right. in those days. They were all young and. Anyway, nice to look at Great those pictures. Great place to be <laughs> at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Newfoundlanders don't get this excited when we see snowflakes falling, but for these refugee children fleeing war in Eritrea, this wasn't only from the season's first snowfall in Toronto last Thursday, but their first snowfall. Yep, Ash is going to have your latest weather forecast. Hope we're smiling like they are. <laughs> it's coming up after the break. The glorious. <laughs>
So the bad weather had to come sometime. It is middle of November. Your first big storm to forecast, really yes. big, do yeah. you think? People have liked Ashley up until now. <laughs> well, as far as, I feel like I haven't actually had a break at all since I started. It's been one storm <laughs> after another, but obviously this yeah. one being uh, the most significant as far as winds go and impact across the province. Uh, into tomorrow afternoon, we are going to see those temperatures drop, and that's when we're going to see things change back over to snow, particularly snow squalls along the west coast, and that could make its way towards the the Buren and uh, parts of the Avalon as well could see uh, those snow squalls into the afternoon. Now, most of the winds will be in the evening hours on Wednesday into Thursday morning as this low pulls away. So we can see the center of the low and that wind in behind it for Labrador as well. That's where those winter storm warnings are going to come into effect. And we'll see gusts upwards of uh, between 90 to 110 kilometers per hour for coastal areas. So that combined with the falling snow, we're looking at blowing snow conditions. And we're gonna see that along the west coast as well into the evening hours and towards the early morning hours on Thursday as that low continues to track a little bit further east. Now, eventually it will taper off as a ridge of high pressure moves in, uh, but those temperatures, as I mentioned, going to be uh, quite cold into the afternoon on Thursday. The strongest winds will occur Wednesday night into Thursday morning along the coastal areas uh, down through to the Avalon as well with gusts between 120 and 140 kilometers per hour. Exposed areas could see winds in excess of that as well. So definitely keep that in mind uh, for Thursday and then windy conditions again for coastal Labrador as well. So looking ahead, Friday, we do get a little bit of break from those winds finally as that ridge of high pressure will move in, clear things out. Not before the next system rolls in. More snow on the way, it looks like. Uh, some of the models pointing at significant snowfall. Others have nothing. So definitely going to have to keep an eye on this low pressure system. But those winds will certainly pick up, it looks like, uh, when, or rather Friday night into Saturday morning as this low continues to track further east. And then in behind that, again, we're going to see more snow for Saturday and then potentially into Sunday as well. So if we take a look at uh, a little bit further ahead at your uh, five-day forecast here. Uh, temperatures are going to drop significantly from tomorrow down below zero as an afternoon high on Friday. That's when that snow will move in again and then windy conditions continuing into Saturday for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Uh, heading towards the west coast, we're going to see uh, snow move in late day Friday into Saturday. Again, temperatures not climbing very much between zero and one degree. It looks like right through the next five days. Same for central Newfoundland and then into Labrador. That's where uh, those temperatures are really going to dip down into the double digits for the most part for western portions. Eastern portions, uh, not quite as bad. We're going to see temperatures in the single digits, but that snow moving in uh, again Friday night and into Saturday. Thanks, Ashley. Now in international news, just days after Donald Trump blamed the California wildfires on poor forest management, the U.S. president is offering federal funds to the hardest hit areas. 44 people are now confirmed dead and the hot, dry, fast winds are not helping. I know a lot of people are interested in when the next rain event will be. We are not seeing any indication of precipitation in the next week and possibly through Thanksgiving. In Northern California, firefighters are struggling to get a handle on the deadliest fire in state history, which has grown since yesterday. Extra search crews, cadaver dogs, and portable morgues are being sent in, and more than 100 people are still unaccounted for. In Southern California, the big fire that killed two people is still burning northwest of Los Angeles. Nearly 200,000 people are under evacuation orders. Well, he has made dramatic escapes from maximum security prisons in Mexico twice. But accused Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is now in custody in New York. And this morning, the man dubbed the most powerful drug trafficker in the world was transported to court for the opening of his trial. Heavily guarded security delivered Guzman to a court in Brooklyn this morning. U.S. authorities say as leader of the Sinaloa cartel, the 61-year-old directed mass shipments of heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and marijuana to the United States. The cartel is one of Mexico's major drug trafficking and organized crime syndicates. Guzman's lawyers signaled they will downplay their client's role in that cartel. 
The trial is going to include unprecedented security for witnesses as it considers 17 criminal charges against Guzman. It's expected to take four months. He has pleaded not guilty but faces life in prison if he's convicted. Well, this photo isn't going to give you any indication where that is. Clearly on a body of water wow. somewhere. Uh, but I thought this was a great shot. It's lovely. The reflections of the clouds. Kind of looks like the boats in the clouds there, right? It does. <laughs> <laughs> the colors are really interesting. It's almost like a painting. Yeah. It does. It's it looks just like pretty. a painting. Well, I'll tell you where this photo was coming up after the break. show went by quick tonight, didn't it? It did. I had so much to talk about tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and but a lot of people absorbing everything that you said. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And a beautiful way to end is and this beauty. a beautiful way to end, exactly. You expect us to guess where in this province this is? Uh, I'm going to say Pooch Cove. No. <laughs> uh, salt water? No. No. Oh. Well, you could have told us that. <laughs> I know, I guess I could have said that. Oh, Gander! Take it in Gander. Debbie, yeah. I'm shocked you did not locate well, this. Well, I did look at the size of that motor <laughs> when we were in commercials, and I oh. said, that's got to be on a big body of water. Big J Lake. Because that's a fairly big, big J. Jay, if I remember oh, maybe correctly. maybe it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Vincent, Tony Vincent sent us this photo. Thank you so much for that. If you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. um, I'm off tomorrow uh, because we've got our big event. You can check out our website for the story behind the story. Check that out. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to listen to and see. Mm -hmm. uh, have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night.